like us to get together, people who like making great software, we love to talk about beginnings. We like to talk about onboarding new users, or bringing uh, new developers up to speed, or launching new products. We like to talk about middles, about troubleshooting problems, about uh, advocating for and developing new features, or scaling up our tools and processes to help more and more people. But something we don't talk about so much is endings. We act like our software is going to live forever. But it happens all the time. Uh, teams get reorganized, projects get discontinued, and companies go bust. And if you haven't worked on a canceled project yet, you probably will someday. Uh, it happened to me uh, earlier this year. I was working on a project where the future looked bright, right up until it didn't. And even if you haven't been on a project like that, I have no doubt you've experienced it as a user. Uh, I got this email, I think, last month from Crash Plan about discontinuing the consumer backup service. This sat in my inbox for like a week, just making me really anxious. Uh, because I knew I had to do something about this. Uh, and even though it wasn't soon, they actually gave me like, I don't know, until next September to, to find a solution for this. Uh, it's still this big imposition. And I'm not I'm not uh, knocking Crash Plan here. They actually did a really good job of communicating this to me. Um, but you know what a huge burden it is to get an email like that. And you know how destructive it is? And you know it has a lasting sting. I can't be the only person who's still angry about Google Reader. <laughs> <laughs> so today I'm going to, going to talk about what needs to happen when a project comes to an end. Uh, to take away the threat and to figure out how to make the most of an unbelievable situation. And so this talk is about getting three things right. First, getting your mindset right. Shutdowns can be really fraught situations. Um, and they can affect you personally, they can affect your teammates personally, uh, and that's something we have to kind of confront. Uh, it's about getting your plan right. Having a plan is essential. This isn't one of those things you get to iterate on. Uh, you, get, you get one opportunity to help people stop using something gracefully. And it's about getting a message right. Uh, there's not a lot to say, but it requires a lot of care and attention to say it in a way that's not going to be uh, a problem. You'll notice that solving complex engineering problems is not on the agenda. There is no actual code in this talk. Uh, I admit that the, the title is a bit of a bait and switch. Uh, but as a practical matter, you know, shutting something down isn't hard. You can start deleting files, you can pull out power cables, you can just walk away. Uh, the, the real challenge is how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to our teammates, and how we talk to our users. Before we get too much of this, I have a couple words on the terminology. Shutdown is this big loaded term that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk. And you might be thinking, uh, I, I work on stuff that's really long lived, or I work in an organization that uh, isn't, isn't going to uh, um, fall down around me anytime soon. And, you know, maybe that's true, uh, but it's often that when we make software, we use these euphemisms like sunsetting feature or retiring a project, or terminating service, <laughs> or deprecating a version, where uh, we think of these as maybe routine parts of the, the software development process. Uh, maybe for you, deprecation is this pretty simple, straightforward event. You have version 1, you have version 2, uh, you're happy with where, where version 2 is at, so version 1 is going away. But your users might interpret that a bit differently. Maybe they see that there is a uh, a feature that in version one that they rely on, and version two doesn't happen. And for maybe for you, it's, it's pretty minor. For them, it's it's the whole thing that uh, that that deprecation is the same as your software going away entirely. And so we don't we don't have to hide behind these fancy words necessarily. Uh, so throughout this talk, I, I do want you to think of um, well, when I do say shut down, I want you to kind of map this onto other events where. Maybe you're taking things away. Not necessarily that it's a big kind of world ending event necessarily, but that it is a big change. So the first step is to get ready. Uh, there are lots of feelings around shutdown events. And they can get complicated and they have a tendency to infect the way we relate to the people around us. And the way we communicate. So for instance, you might be really happy. Maybe your company is getting acquired and this shutdown that you're that you're going through is part of you getting a big payday. Or maybe you're relieved. Maybe you're an open source maintainer and 
uh, you've decided, you know what, I'm not going to work on this anymore, and I'm, I'm freeing myself from this big maintenance group. Or maybe you're scared, maybe your company is faltering, and maybe this is a sign of things to come. Or maybe you're angry, maybe you've worked on something for a long time, and you put a lot of, of your uh, enthusiasm and, and your skill into it, and management has decided, you know what, we're working on something else now, and we don't need this anymore. Or maybe you're sad. Maybe just maybe the software isn't, isn't meaningful at all. Maybe it's just that uh, you know people are being reorganized, and so you uh, that a team that you've come to rely on and respect, uh, you know, you're not going to get to work with them anymore. And all of these are completely reasonable feelings, but they're not necessarily the kinds of things we want to focus uh, <coughs> on, on the people around us. And so, if you're going to help your users or your teammates, you do need to get your head in the right place. We talk about software as if it's this rational and scientific thing, but I guarantee you that you're not. And so emotions are real and we have to manage them. And even if you're not having a problem necessarily, the people around you might be. So the first thing you do in a shutdown situation is actually nothing. Uh, to the extent that you're able, don't commit to any near future action. The more time you can buy yourself in early on, the better. Uh, as it gives you time to plan, and it gives you time to readjust to, uh, to this new situation. Uh, there may be pressures on you to, to move very quickly. Maybe uh, management has a tight deadline in mind. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe there are financial considerations, there are bills to pay. Uh, but to the extent that you can push back on these things, do so, because this time very, very early on is going to be very valuable. And if you can't, uh, that's okay too. Um, the, the stuff I'm going to talk about may be less uh, helpful in that kind of situation, uh, but if you are faced with that, I think it's okay to acknowledge that someone's made a decision for you to be kind of miserable and to look out for you. So if you if you do get this time, uh, it's it's a chance to catch your breath, and so in the first few hours you can go out to the pub with your team and you can uh, complain or celebrate or grieve, whatever the case happens to be. And then, um, but after that, I want you to go by yourself with a pen and paper, and I want you to write down everything that you've achieved and everything you've learned working on this project. Uh, this has two benefits. One, uh, it's a good exercise for your resume or your CV, and it's uh, especially if you know your job might not be long for this world. And the the other benefit of this is that this is the first concrete step you get to take forward on this. That. Uh, this is going to be a, an exercise that will moderate the emotions because it takes this big event that has happened and turns it into a process that you can work on. The next thing you can do is look at your user base. Uh, how many active daily users do you have? How many API tokens have you issued? How many people have downloaded your library? Uh, how many billing clients do you have? Whatever the metrics that you use to assess the the sort of the scale of your user base, you know, take a look at those numbers because that's your audience. These are the people you're going to have to communicate to uh, to, uh, to make a success of this situation. Uh, for people who uh, take communications uh, very seriously, um, for the most part I'm a technical writer, uh, for people like great documentation, this is a perversely big opportunity. It's not often that you need to reach every one of your users and communicate something really important to them all at once. But when you look at those numbers, I want you to remind yourself that you're not your user. That you're not your teammates, you're not your management, you're not your shareholders, you're not anybody else. I want you to acknowledge and respect that your experience is going to be different from all those people. Uh, and I want you to keep this idea in the front of your mind uh, as you go through this process, because it's the key to avoiding some big mistakes. So once you've calibrated your expectations, it's time for step two, which is to make a plan. Uh, this is something you don't you don't do alone. Uh, this uh, this plan is necessarily going to bring all of these big pieces together. So, um, for instance, there there are people who are responsible for maybe doing support with your users. They're talking to your users on a daily basis. They're helping them solve problems. They're going to be really involved in this process. Uh, operations people, 
people who keep the lights on, who are ultimately going to turn the lights out, uh, they're going to have a lot to do during this period. And it's an engineering concern that you're going to probably make changes to your software as you go through this process. And so the first thing that's actually going to go on this plan is to stop your existing outreach. Uh, you might have blog posts scheduled to go up. You might have social media accounts that are sort of on autopilot. You may have drip marketing email. You may have advertising. You may have all of these different things that draw people to your software. And you want to kind of put the brakes on that. Uh, you don't want to be talking at cost purposes to yourself. It happened to me once that I got an email from a service that I was using. They said, in 30 days, we're shutting down. It was a bummer. Uh, and then a few hours later, I get an email from them saying, don't forget to refer a friend. If they stay on the service for 90 days, we will get a cut. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to. <laughs> the next thing to do is look at all of the ways you, all the channels that you have to communicate with your users. Uh, and you probably have a lot more of these than you will do. And, and you're going to want to think about how these can be used to do this outreach, uh, to, to tell people that, that things are going to change soon. So email, I'm sure you, uh, that you're familiar with you know, newsletters and transactional email. Uh, these are opportunities to either make big announcements or to issue recurring reminders. Uh, blog posts and, and status blogs are another place where people are going to be uh, looking for this kind of information. Uh, social media. Uh, maybe your users aren't big on keeping up with their email, maybe they don't subscribe to your RSS feed, uh, but maybe they're on your Facebook page or your Twitter account. Uh, sales and support. Uh, there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of process around this stuff, uh, uh, particularly like in, in large organizations. Uh, uh, sales teams are actually a really uh, often have a, a strong relationship with with value customers, and that can be uh, an important tool uh, to take advantage of late in the process when you have those stragglers that uh, uh, move along. Your user interface. Uh, there's uh, there's definitely going to be changes to make during this process. You know, you're going to shut off. Uh, new signups, or you're going to add a, a warning message to your command line user uh, APIs. Uh, now is probably not the time to implement some kind of non-error warning system, but if you've already got some way to, to use the API to communicate, that's a great way to get the attention of external developers. Uh, events. If you're going to be at meetups or conferences with people who are going to be impacted by the changes you're going to make, that's a really big opportunity. Documentation. Uh, PyPI, people actually read the description that you have for your, for your library on PyPI. Uh, so you can update that and you can, you can make a note that, you know, that maybe the, the API that this connects to uh, isn't going to be supported soon. Uh, GitHub uh, actually gives you lots of tools to sort of catch people uh, in, in the process of, of, of maybe trying to use something that is, is going to be unsupported or is going to change in significant way. So you can update your readme file. You can change the contributing template so that, uh, when you open a new issue or pull request. Um, so these are just some of the tools you have to, to reach out to people, to tell them that the big changes are coming. And you're going to want to use them in uh, an escalation strategy to to get more and more attention uh, at various points in this process. And generally, the situations kind of look a bit like this, where there's an initial ramp up in, of intensity, where you're going to make this big noisy announcement early on. Then you're going to uh, kind of drop back to a quieter but increasingly annoying period of reminders, where you say, look, there's two weeks left, there's one week, one week left, six days, and so on. And then there'll be this big noisy, uh, uh, you know, like claps on warning and flashing lights uh, at the very end when you actually shut down, and then uh, you'll kind of turn everything off. And you're going to want to think of this pattern as you actually set a schedule for, uh, for this shutdown. And a great way to approach this is to start uh, with an end date, so the, the last day when your 
library supported or the last day that your APIs were responding to requests or, or whatever your sort of target is, and work backwards. And the first thing you're going to want to do is strike out all the days you can't actually do anything. So you're going to, oh, uh, you're going to want to get rid of weekends. Uh, you don't really want to be working on weekends, and no one's going to read your announcement email on the weekend. Uh, you'll want to uh, strike out uh, bank holidays, uh, both yours and uh, the ones of your users and your teammates, which may not be the same. I'm American, but I live in the UK. I'm acutely aware that I'm not working necessarily the same days as other people. Uh, if, you're, if you know your team or uh, or your users are going to have their attention somewhere else during during a long period, you're going to strike out those days too. So if you're on vacation, uh, you're uh, you're having a team offsite, these kinds of things, uh, you're not going to want to plan activity around those times. And if you can be really generous with yourself, uh, just, just strike out every Friday. <laughs> and what you have left is actually not that much time. Uh, but these are going to be the days where you can make really big changes or where you can make significant announcements. And it also helps to think of these as, as maybe no earlier than dates, dates where you're going to start breaking commitments, uh, not necessarily that you're going to carry out some complete task. Uh, for instance, you might, uh, you might be tempted to say, on the 27th, we're going to delete all the user data. Uh, but you might have to go through a long process of, of you know, figuring out how to comply with data retention laws and to, to, throw out, uh, to figure out what you can keep and what you have to throw out. Uh, so it's easier to say, on the 27th, we'll begin uh, the meeting game. So now we get sort of to the easier part, which is uh, figuring out what to say and how to say it. Uh, this doesn't represent a huge effort, but it is really, really sensitive. Uh, we want to, we wanna, when we communicate with people who, who are going to face this imposition, the, the, these big changes, uh, it's, it's important to be calm. Uh, you don't want to incite panic. This is going to be a deliberate, planned event, even if it's not. Uh, some of your users may be inclined to, to panic. Uh, some of your teammates may be inclined to panic. Uh, to the extent that you can sort of project some level of confidence about this, uh, can, be, can be really helpful. Uh, next, you want to be gentle. You know, if your hostile calls for a jokey, friendly tone, now is probably not the time for that. Uh, you're you're making an imposition. This has a level of seriousness, and and you need to be gentle and kind about this. And then you want to be direct. Subtlety is not your friend in this situation. Maybe you're you know to just kind of. Go back to those euphemisms I mentioned. You might have a sense for what transition means or what sunsetting means, uh, but in in but the people who have to confront these problems might not be versed in this kind of language, and so it's important to, to be uh, rather direct about what these things are in concrete terms. Uh, I want to remind you again that it's it's not about you. There's this cliche about about startups that. Uh, they, they get enough attention and they get enough users and that uh, some, some big company swoops in, uh, buys them out and, and shuts down the, the project. And then the startup sends out this email saying, oh, we've learned so much from you, but now we're moving on to bigger and better things. But if you're on the receiving end of that message, it reads more like, it's been so great to earn your business so we could let you down later. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you search for this phrase, our incredible journey, uh, there's like a whole blog cataloging this, uh, this phenomenon of, of teams thinking that the good fortune they have is also that of their unit. And it's not always the case. Instead, I want you to give your readers just the facts. First, what is happening in concrete terms? Uh, are you going to stop charging my credit card? Uh, are my requests to your API going to be rejected? Uh, is, is someone going to stop answering the phone uh, for my support call? Next, when is it happening? What are these major milestones? Uh, when will I have to take action? When will I not be able to get new API tokens? When will, uh, when will these uh, requests to the API start returning for a force? Uh, and then lastly, 
what does this mean for me? What, do I, what actions do I actually have to take in this situation? And what this means for your particular software project is going to vary. Uh, but it's mostly about giving your readers an exit. Uh, the, when, when faced with this kind of situation, it's not necessarily obvious what, what action needs to take place, what I have to do to, to solve this problem. And um, so, so it is your responsibility to, to guide people to the exit. It's a bit like the airline safety briefings. The, the nearest exit may be behind you. There may be some or unorthodox things that need to happen. Uh, in order to, to gracefully leave. Um, and, and if you want to look like a, like a real class act, you can, you can refer people to uh, alternatives that maybe you're not responsible for, uh, but might be helpful to, uh, to, your, uh, <coughs> to your users. Um, people may ask why, and this is a really touchy area. And I don't think you actually owe anybody an explanation. The re retiring to drink my ties on the beach is just as legitimate as running out of money. Uh, <laughs> um, you can say why you're doing this if you want to, but it's important not to open a negotiation. Uh, you've made a decision, you're following through, don't muddy the water in the cold. Uh, in, in the sort of best case scenario is that you're delaying the inevitable. Uh, this does leave one last thing you should say though, which is thank you. It's a funny situation. The worst case scenario is not a bunch of angry users. It's a bunch of people who don't care. Uh, it's like a bit like public speaking. Uh, so for the people who are angry, saying thank you can go a long ways toward neutralizing those bad feelings. Aviators have a saying, which is that a good landing is one that you can walk away from. Uh, this process won't be a lot of fun, but you can have a really big impact. You can make people's lives better, or at least a little less worse, uh, if, you, if you approach this with some planning and care. And if you can get everyone out in a, in a nice orderly fashion, then you've done good by yourself, by your teammates, and by your users. And then there's only one, la one thing left to do, which is to make another trip to the pub and raise a glass to your dearly departed software. <laughs> Slides are there. I've tweeted with the link uh, on the PyCon hashtag. And if you like this, uh, you might want to uh, look into your nearest Write the Docs a meetup or conference. Uh, and I've got Write the Docs. I think we have a little bit of questions before we go to break. Does so anyone have any, any, anything that you'd like to ask Daniel? How do you deal with users of your software who feel betrayed by the fact that you so the, the question was, how do I deal with users who feel betrayed by, by this change? I okay. specifically think we have Pebble and how they got caught out. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, I, think, I think to a certain degree some people will, will feel that way. Uh, especially if you've done really well. If you, if you serve them well, then people are going to be disappointed. Um, I, I think I think you can say you can say thank you. You can say you're the chart, uh, but um, I think I think showing up and, and helping them find their way to an alternative is is it, it's the thing that you can do. Is is the level of responsibility you have, and um, and you can't be you're not responsible for other people's feelings. Yeah. Wait. Where do you, where do you stand on handing over something you're not going to maintain it, maintain it anymore? Is there a way for it to do it? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think that there are... I think that represents a similar situation where it's likely that you're going to be changing your... the commitments that you're making in that process. That, that someone taking something over you know, might have a different perspective on how quickly you know, emails are going to get responses, or or what kinds of feature requests are going to be accepted, or or, or that kind of thing. And um, giving people notice that this is going to happen uh, is um, is going to be um, one of the important things. Uh, it's it's surprises that that get people right. It's, it's uh, 
changes are hard, but um, if you have time to, to kind of adapt to them and to, to respond, uh, to, or not respond to them, to, to accept them, uh, then that's, that's really helpful. That's all we have time for. We've been now going into the afternoon break after which we'll have lightning talks and the UK Bike Association AGM. But until then, please join me again in thanking Daniel for an excellent talk.